Welcome to the Hudson Institute. Uh, I'm Brian Clark. I'm a senior fellow here at the Institute, and I'm a director of the Hudson Center for Defense Concepts and Technology. Uh, we are honored to have with us today uh, Jim Takelet, who is the president, CEO, and chairman uh, of Lockheed Martin, uh, the largest uh, defense contractor in the United States. Um, he's a uh, Air Force uh, guy. I, we won't hold that against him, though. So uh, <laughs> command pilot of uh, C-141s uh, with uh, thousands of hours of service. I want to bring that up up front. Uh, but before uh, he joined Lockheed Martin, uh, he was also CEO, president, and chairman of American Tower, which is, I believe, the largest uh, mobile network uh, operator in the United, or mobile network uh, infrastructure provider in the United States, to be more specific. Mm -hmm. uh, but thank you very much for being with us here, Jim. Uh, we're looking forward to a conversation about 21st century warfighting. Glad to be here, Brian. Thanks for having me. Uh, we're going to, uh, you know, Jim and I will chat here for, you know, a half hour or so, uh, and then uh, we are going to open it up for questions from the audience. So uh, if you uh, have those, um, I'll turn to you and we can uh, have a microphone brought around to you, but just uh, be thinking about that as we uh, go through the discussion today. But, but to start, I wanted to kind of open with, with some uh, a, a kind of a broader discussion about what's happening in uh, DOD right now. Um, so the, uh, you know, the department, uh, multiple studies have come out recently, including one by RAND, including one by us, looking at um, kind of the, uh, the eroding uh, nature of U.S. military dominance. You know, how we're, we're kind of entering an era where the U.S. is no longer able to kind of be the, the, the predominant military, dictate terms to adversaries, deter in the way that we did before. Um, Kath Hicks even mentioned this, the Deputy Secretary of Defense, uh, a couple of weeks ago when she rolled out the Replicator Initiative, and she talked about how we're going to have to rely on operational innovation to, to regain an advantage. Um, so kind of where do you see the U.S. Mil uh, military competition with uh, an opponent like China, um, and where do you think we're going to be able to get advantage uh, going forward into the future? Sure, Brian. Well, I think that the U.S. defense enterprise is still the most effective in the world. Uh, I think we can deter conflict effectively today. Uh, however, I think there is an erosion in, in, ongoing, and we need to change significantly the way the defense enterprise operates to stay ahead of that potential threat. And if you go back to first principles, uh, you know, if you, on one hand, so come, coming from east and west, you have Clausewitz and Sun Tzu. Sun Tzu's part, uh, part of Sun Tzu's uh, doctrine is bide your time, quietly build your strength. When you have, you know, pick a number, 90% certainty or expectation of your success, you strike decisively. And the goal of, of our company, Lockheed Martin, the way I characterize it is, yes, we're in the aerospace and defense industry, but we're in the deterrence business. So how can we help the U.S. and its allies move that 90% goalpost down the field continuously, not every 10 years when we can build a new airplane or a new Aegis radar, but every three to six months. How do we help DOD and our allies move that deterrence goalpost every three to six months? The digital technology industry is able to do that in weeks sometimes, let alone months. Uh, our per, uh, procurement cycle uh, with the Department of Defense, Congress, the, the system that's in place today, is really built for Newtonian goods, complex yeah. Newtonian goods, large capital ships, jet aircraft, satellites. These are devices and platforms that do take years to develop. And that is the probably, it could be a little shorter, maybe right. a little more efficient, but the general procurement system right. is matched up with the development time cycle of Newtonian technology. However, the digital technology cycle is, again, months or weeks instead of years and years. So we're suggesting to our government customers to think about the procurement and acquisition process differently for digital technology insertion versus Newtonian platform production. Uh, that hasn't caught on yet, right. but I think it's something we really need to advocate for. And it, it would take basically the establishment of a parallel acquisition system run by the Department of Defense, but populated with people from inside and outside the department, inside and outside of our industry, and really have a clock speed that is much closer to the digital technology development clock speed than it is Newtonian. So that's one thing I do think we need to do to kind of stay ahead of the, the, the evolving threat, so to speak. Uh, 
This has been done before, by the way. Um, so in the, the commercial telecommunications industry where I spent the last 20 years of my professional life before joining Lockheed Martin's management was basically going through two, three, four, and now 5G right. in the span of basically one DOD Newtonian development cycle, 20, 25 years. And so the, re the way we're able to do that, and we didn't do it right the first time, was establishment of standards. So what are the interfaces? What are the APIs? What are the frequencies everyone's going to use to go from 2G, which is 56 kilobits per second bandwidth, to 5G eventually, which is gigabits per second? I mean, it's a whole, these are order of magnitude changes of capability over a 20, 25 year period. Unfortunately, we started with three sets of standards. One that was developed by Nextel, another one was developed by Qualcomm, and a third one was developed in Europe called GSM. And the networks were expensive, inefficient, and incompatible. <laughs> so I'd like to skip that stage and go right to the single standard, which is what we have now. It's called LTE, long-term evolution, for 4G. Now, there's a 5G standard. It's also being uh, refined. It'll be a single standard, so you can buy a phone in Seoul, South Korea, use it in Washington, D.C., and it's completely compatible with the networks that are here. So we need to skip that stage of competing standards or architectures right. and along with a parallel procurement process also establish a standards body like we have in, in, in telecom 3gpp or uh, the on go alliance for example to basically get commercial industry aerospace industry government customer and you know the investor and startup and new entrants together to create a standard that we'll all compete on and all develop together. And that is something very new for the DOD. It doesn't exist today, but we're really suggesting that that's a good way to go here. So let me, let's pull the string a little bit on this idea of um, you know, integration uh, and standards. So uh, you know, I think when people hear standards, they think of it's just one waveform, one frequency, one you know, data architecture. So it's you know, one to rule them all, and that's gonna be really hard to you know, established and then it becomes relatively fixed and, and sta stable. Um, but I think what you're talking about with 3GPP is it's, a, it's an evolving standard. So it's a, it's a governance structure really for uh, folks to bring in their new ideas for how the network gets configured or new waveforms that get incorporated into right. it. Obviously, we're all familiar with 5G as different frequencies associated with it and different waveforms. So you're talking about something that's more about this, uh, an evolving governance structure that's maintaining compatibility. Yeah, it's a, it's a living organism that incorporates the newest technology constantly right. as it moves forward over time. And you know, the, essentially, the standard is going to be changing continuously over time, but instead of having eight waveforms that everybody's right. competing on, right. there's two or three that you can really put some scale behind and some effectiveness behind. And there's only so much investment for any industry, including ours. Right. You, you, we need to have a standards set so that the common architecture is fixed, but evolving constantly into the future with new technology. So, and, and I, you know, I think one thing that people kind of miss, and this is something that, you know, Cathex did mention was the driver for all this, you know, was the need for a more adaptable force, a more agile force. Right. You know, we are not going to have, you know, the mass or the geographic advantage if we were to have a confrontation with China in the Western Pacific. Um, so are, do you see it, like, are you working at Lockheed Martin on paths to be able to enable that more adaptable force you know, through your own efforts to try to make for a more compatible data and network architectures. Yes, and if you go back to the first principles of deterrence, you want the uh, enemy's wargaming or thought process to not get to the point where we should act decisively and make a, a, a significant move or attack mm -hmm. on the U.S. or its allies or breach the NATO border, for example, in Eastern Europe. So we want to keep the uncertainty level yep. as high as possible right. and the potential uh, effectiveness level of our force structure yep. elevated and, and continuously improving again every three to six months at least. And we're doing that at our company, we're sort of trying to pathfind this idea with missions. And so we, I asked our technology team and engineering organization to define a number of missions, a handful, it ended up being 14, that 
we could do a technology roadmap, not for just the platform, there's a technology roadmap for the F-35, but there isn't a technology roadmap for air-to-air -air combat that the DOD can lay out with today's existing platform, systems, command and control uh, networks, et cetera, and say, okay, here's what I have today. I've got F-35s, F-22s, F-16s, F-18s, et cetera. How am I going to maintain air dominance over the, whether it's the Western uh, Pacific or it's Eastern Europe? How am I going to do that mission and make it better and better to make it, again, more complex for the enemy to decide, I can win this right. air battle? Right. And what we're, we've done there is we've said, okay, let's make sure the data links are compatible between all those aircraft. What data links do we have today? There's three or four. How do we get an F-16 that was designed in the 70s right. to have a direct data link to an F-35, which is designed in the 90s and 2000s? And that is not an easy problem to solve. But once you solve it, you could take targeting data from an F-16 200 miles away right data link it to an F-35 with no human interaction at all, and, on, and I used to be an Air Force pilot, on the cockpit panel, you're gonna see a target that you can hit. And all that's gonna be done in the background with digital technology and complicate the enemy's success equation. Right. And so for the 14 missions, we've mapped out four of them so far at the SAP level. So very compartmented, high security clearance levels to say, yeah, there are some things that came out of Skunk Works or uh, Phantom works that most people don't know about, but the ones we know about really fit into this mission. And how do we incorporate everything across all the, the clearance right. levels to make that mission just better and better and better using digital technology? So it's 5G, AI, autonomy, those kinds of things are on that clock speed that's much faster than the right. DOD normal procurement system. How do we do that? Right, and so I, and you're, I think what you're saying too is that um, the adaptability that you're affording to you know, the warfighter downrange, right? Because obviously you know, back here, we're not gonna come up with how they're gonna really fight. That'll be something that they have to create on the fly in a lot of cases. Mm -hmm. You're affording that flexibility through digital technology because it's not, the hardware's not gonna change. It's gonna be right. what they do. If we, if we wanna have a more effective air-to-air -air combat scenario in three months, we're gonna use the aircraft we have right. like right now. Right. Now, we can introduce autonomy into those aircraft. So we've flown, uh, actually it was on the cover of Aviation Week uh, about a year ago. We've flown a Blackhawk, very legacy technology from the Newtonian <laughs> physical world, fully autonomously with an iPad. It, and I did it myself. So it just shows you how easy that you can make a mission better and use, say, less pilots going into a hot landing zone or doing air evacs, those kinds of things and really preserve your capability in ways that you couldn't have done before? Right. Or how do we take digital technology to make sure that the accuracy of our LORASM, long range anti-ship missile, is so much better that instead of firing four to sink a ship, we can fire two to sink a ship right. because we know exactly where they should hit, yeah. we know exactly where that ship is and how fast it's moving, and we've got continuous targeting update as that LORASM is going through the air. And now we have twice as many Lorasms. Right. Okay, so there, there, we can continually upgrade our mission capability, sinking ships, surface warfare, by using the equipment we have today, but digitally advantaging it way more than we could ever do by building more of them, because it will take time and money to do that. Right, and, and so doing that, you're gonna have to uh, integrate with the, the products of other companies. You right. know, so, you, so to be able to have that LRASM be more effective, it might have to draw upon sensor data that's coming from a sensor somebody else built, yeah. uh, or from a submarine that's yeah. coming data. Absolutely, and we've already agreed with Northrop Grumman, for example, to have, work with them to have an integrated multi-service, so different OEMs provide command and control systems for different services or locations that we're gonna merge all of our data. Right. And the future is a notion of data fusion from multiple sensors, command and control systems that link to existing platforms, and AI that can really help speed up dramatically information to the decision maker, the human commander, if you will, right. to say, I've got 500 targets out there, they're all coming at us now, and I've got a thousand effectors, what's the best optimized targeting for each of those vehicles coming at us to make sure we, op we, we maximize the benefit of the, of the weaponry we have today? Right. And that's a deterrent factor, right? right? So if 
if a, a potential adversary thinks, well, I'll only lose 20% of my incoming aircraft, I can live with that, but maybe it's 40%. Right. And they, don't, they can't, can't be play sure. their war game out with any kind of certainty. We keep moving that goalpost further into time and hopefully infinitely into time where that decision never gets made. Right. So, so one, one uh, thing that this brings up, which we wanted to talk about, was the idea of commercial technology. And so you, know, you, you talked about digital, you know, uh, digital integration, digital engineering being really where there's a lot of, uh, the, the, that's where the advantage is going to arrive from. And we need a different path for being able to acquire that. Uh, is that the, the mechanism by which these, a lot of new commercial players that are on the scene you know, can interface? Um, with you know the existing force because the problem they have now is these new players don't have their own gear they're having to figure out how to play with the existing military right well if you add the open architecture platform together with the procurement system that will inter will, will interoperate with these technology companies these digital technology companies we can marshal all of us industry and all of our allied industry eventually that's willing to participate in improving national defense and deterrence. So the only way to marshal all of industry is to establish uh, workflows and mechanisms so that they will want to participate in right. advancing deterrence. And by the way, the, the commercial technology industry, whether it's venture capital, mid-scale, or Microsoft and IBM, they have the lion's share of technical talent going to their industry, resident in their industry. They have the lion's share of intellectual property already that they advance constantly and spend billions and billions of dollars of IR&D that we can't afford as an aerospace industry and government really can't even afford to do and keep up with them. So we want to migrate as much of commercially developed uh, digital technology as makes sense into the, is the, the national defense enterprise. And how do we do that right. is to open up the aperture for them to participate with the DOD procurement system. So what I'm trying to, again, pathfind at least our company, and this will apply to the Boeings and the Northrop Grumman's and the General Dynamics, et cetera, over time, I hope, which is we want to welcome these digital technologies, their capabilities, their IP, and bridge them to the DOD procurement right. system. Right. So we will take care of dealing with the federal acquisition regulation, make sure we're compliant, handle the audits, and most importantly, I think, Brian, you alluded to, integrate with the platforms. Right. Because a startup or, or a new entrant, so to speak, as you said, doesn't bring their own platform. It's the Northrop Grumman's and the Boeing's and the Lockheed Martin's that bring the platforms. Right. And we need their digital technology to make our platforms more effective constantly over time. It's the only way to, without a new platform, like the NGAD potentially, you know, a number of years from now, let's say, that you can just start with a clean sheet of paper. We've got to start with what we have and start upgrading that mission capability right now and use their IP and their talent to help us do that. And so how does the, how does the government, uh, how should the government be thinking about how to structure its acquisition efforts to enable that? Because you know, right now, uh, you know, DOD, doesn't really buy, I mean, they have some software acquisition paths and software right. appropriations, which are not being used very much. Um, so generally they try to buy products or it's a straight up service. Mm -hmm. um, and they don't necessarily have a mechanism by which a program manager like owns the interfaces associated with a particular combat system and right. manages it like a commercial side would. So how does this, how, how does the government need to kind of adapt to create this path that you're talking about? So the, as you mentioned, the existing acquisition systems based on programs of record, you know, multi-year uh, concept development, RFPs, RFIs, coming back, competitions, takes years to get through that. And, and it's fine on the bigger mm -hmm. physical uh, technology items. It, it, it does work, it's been successful. However, that's why, your point is why there's a separate and parallel yeah. path of of acquisition that's needed for these digital technologies. Because by the time you get through the RFI and the RFP, you're already three generations past what you were trying to get done in the digital world. And so well, that's the notion of the parallel path, which is we've got to be able to deal with these companies that generally work off of a subscription model. I mean, you know, just your cell phone service, for example. You pay every month for it. Um, they continually upgrade the network. You're getting new features, another app comes on your phone, that app gets upgraded every night. 
and this is continuously happening. And so the DOD doesn't really have an effective way to buy services. Right. And, and service is not just you know, a data center type service, right. Right. but a mission capability. Right. Right. By the month, by the year, we have to figure out how to translate the DOD uh, form DD250 into a subscription service so I can use Verizon's 5G algorithms. And we're actually teamed with Verizon. That's one of the public uh, announcements we've already made. We're teamed with IBM Red Hat on managing uh, AI digitization through a network. Um, we're partnered with, uh, uh, with Intel on just chip design to make sure that we can get our requirements into the na main chip production line and that someday that the commercial industry is going to need, not just to yep. yet today, but they're going to need it. We have to, we have to collaborate with these companies, which our industry isn't typically used to doing, right. and the government is not used to paying for. And so that, that bridging uh, uh, potential or opportunity really is there, and we're trying to show it's there and, and get some of these companies, big and small, uh, to participate with us right. and make sure their business can be successful and they can make margins, and, and because they've got lots of commercial business they can go get. If, if the DOD hands, uh, hamstrings their ability to be successful companies, they will put their effort yeah. towards commercial uh, sectors that don't have those, those constraints. Right, right. And so that means uh, for the government side, they, you have to, one, you need to have like the expertise. You need people that are the program managers for these digital right. programs that are familiar with how do you buy software? How, mm -hmm. do you, how do you maintain an upgrade cycle? How do you right. DevOps? How do you facilitate that? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it puts the government in the position of owning you know, pieces of the software ecosystem, uh, or at least owning the, the rights to them. Mm -hmm. Uh, right. As opposed to owning the hard, owning the piece of equipment, which right. is you know you deliver the hardware and then you know the government now owns it, mm -hmm. um, which is a very different model. And I think you know commercial businesses are comfortable with that model, mm -hmm. where their their purchasing managers do that already, right. um, or the iOS you know program manager mm -hmm. is in charge of making sure the app store is you know going to be safe and secure. Mm -hmm. right. So, but so it, it, is the government going to be able to bring in these people that have the kind of expertise to buy software in a more effective way? I think they can, but it has to be this joint effort, right? So that, again, the platform providers, those of us that you know, build command and control systems that are secure and multi-classification today and can move data around in those worlds, we have to team with these commercial companies. So the ability to do uh, multi-level multi right. classification, so take a SAP level or SCI data off a yeah. satellite get it into an airplane cockpit at the right classification level and, and ma mask the source of it, right. that's something that the aerospace companies can do. We, we know how to do that. Right. We've worked with the government to do it. It's not something that IBM Red Hat probably knows no. how to do. No. So we need to put our IP in with theirs, which we may have the fastest error correction algorithm, for example, to get that data there. And they manage you know, already huge data flows. They just don't have multi-classification. We have to get our expertise together right. in a way that the, the DOD can purchase it. The way the, the, the way the DOD should be able to purchase that is a subscription right. to the link between SCI satellite data yeah. and uh, frontline US aircraft squadrons. That's a service. Right. And you would, you know, theoretically, as a government, pay th for that by the year or by the quarter or by right. the month to maintain that service. Right. They won't own a lot of the equipment right. that those bits that flow through. Yeah. And the, the, the way to envision this is we, we do war gaming and map, we call it operational analysis, yeah. Lockheed Martin. Okay, these ships are going out this way. These submarines are coming back. There's going to be a sea battle. Here's how it's going to play out. But there isn't a lot of mapping of data flows, right? A data flow is, I've got sensor data from that satellite, I need to get it on the cockpit panel of the F-16 so the pilot can see with enough uh, certainty where to point his high PRF radar and quit scanning and put all the radar energy on, on a targeting level track to shoot that enemy before it can see me. Those are the kinds of things that we have to map the data flow for. Because it's going to go from a Space Force satellite, maybe through an Aegis radar, right. back up to the aircraft, and all those things are incompatible today. Right. right. 
And so what you, so DOD needs people that are responsible for buying that data flow. Mm -hmm. And maybe there is some modification to different platforms along the line. So right. someone's got to you know, buy that, and then someone's got to pay for the, the service. That's right. Those are all things that generally don't have a, an owner. They don't have a home, mm -hmm. you know, usually in DOD. Right. But there is a good start. The, the yeah. CDAO, this chief data right. uh, definition officers that, right. that is being put in place, this office right. in, the, in the Pentagon, is at least starting out by right. saying we all have to have the same definitions for what data is. Right. You know, what is a uh, what is a target track? Right. You know, what parameters do we use to define it? What's the error that we're willing to accept as we as that data travels through the system? How do we validate it hasn't been hacked, by the way, along the, right. the route? And so that's it's it's off to a start, but it's got to go all the way through the the, the data, right. as you said. The, 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 how does the DoD get provide itself a service? for data flows and not hardware, right. in addition to hardware, I must say, actually. Right, and so you know, to, to you know, give a shout out to Congress, there's, there's legislation pending in the, in the NDAA and the appropriations bill that would help address some of this. You know, the appropriations bill is gonna you know, pull some funding lines together to give to CDAO to buy the kind of data flow that you're talking about. Right. Uh, and then there's work on the NDAA to try to create the, at least in the research and engineering and acquisition and sustainment uh, offices, people that are responsible for buying that integrated capability. Right. Um, so I think there's, you know, they're definitely moving in that direction. Um, and I think, you know, obviously it needs to be faster. Uh, so to, to kind of pivot to, you know, uh, an adjacent topic. So, you know, commercial industry, you know, obviously can be brought to, brought to bear to help uh, augment DOD through mechanisms like, you know, digital capabilities. Are there other ways that the, you know, we need to think about tapping into commercial industry because obviously there's a huge amount of investment going in there. DOD people or people in defense are concerned about the industrial base. How do we better leverage what the commercial world has to, to bring? So, so there's the conduct of companies that are new entrants, say, to the, the defense department space. They are backed by investors. And investors tend to be either private equity, venture capital, uh, individuals or small firms generally that control billions of dollars of investment capital. The other way to help accelerate this process is to take advantage of that investment capital in effective ways, right? And so what we're working with a number of, of large investors on is the notion that Yes, you can back a new entrant into the defense space, but your investment is likely to return much more quickly and more effectively if we team up together. Because until you get into platforms and existing command and control systems with whatever software you think you're developing here in this startup, it's probably going to have a hard time getting into the, in, into the DOD in a way that's meaningful for your investment. Right. Not for your company, but for your investment, because these yeah. investors have other places that they can put their money versus DOD missions if there's not going to be a return there. So what I try to remind our government customers, too, is that whether it's Lockheed Martin or a smaller company or a startup, we are in, this is a free market economy. Right. Right. We are in a competitive capital market, meaning whether it's my investors or a startup venture investor, they can move their money somewhere else. Uh, they can sell our stock. Uh, they can make our, our bond prices higher because it's riskier, whatever they may say. Or I like Microsoft better today. And so we're in a competitive capital market. We need to be successful in performing for the investors. And so do the new entrants. And so the, the notion there is let's set this common architecture. Let's work together to do it. Big tent, everyone's in. Startups, midsize, new entrants. Lockheed Martin, Boeing, Microsoft, Verizon. That's the kind of group you want in the standards body to make sure that everyone can contribute with the best available technology that's out there. And that'll make those investors more successful. So we're working with the investor side. We're working with the companies to say, how do you work with us to get your good algorithm into our platform that flies today in the USAF and Paycom or wherever it may be. And, and that's starting to get traction because this go it alone uh, kind of notion doesn't really work in the Department of Defense, which right. is so complex and so already highly embedded. And we're getting some traction on the investor side, the companies, uh, our, our peer group, and I think government too. 
So, so one of the challenges with you know, having the kind of approach with a standards body, and we try to make it so everybody can uh, contribute or participate, like in telecom, mm -hmm. is you end up with one of the challenges like telecom has experienced, which is you know, margins go down, becomes more competitive, you know, companies are not able to kind of have the wherewithal to, to continue. Whereas if they had a proprietary lock on some, you know, small aspect of the DOD's networks, they could mine that for pretty good profit. Mm -hmm. So um, companies, you know, might want to try to do the go it alone approach because they're going to try to have a proprietary uh, approach to some aspect of the network that they can own. Right. Um, how do you convince them to, to not take that track? Well, the the Department of Defense itself is concerned with what they call vendor lock, right? So if you've got vendor lock on, on a, a physical platform, they try to avoid that, compete it, you know, have another competition, get a second supplier. Same with digital, right? They're not going to want to be locked into a proprietary system, which then gives the supplier, you know, huge market power against yeah. the DOD. So this is actually pro-competitive to do it the way that we're right. talking about. And yes, the, the margins can be significant if your, your technology makes it into the standard. Yeah. So you've, you've got, it's again, competitive technology market, competitive talent market, right. competitive capital market. This is pro-competitive if we can set that playing field where whether it's, because um, uh, it'll be brief, technical advantage or uh, inside right. you know, connection into a decision maker that there's not vendor lock then created in the digital world like they're trying to avoid creating in the physical world. Right, yeah. right, right. And, and then companies will then have to compete on the basis of how good their technology is right. rather than the fact that they happen to own the proprietary standard. Exactly. So um, you're talking a little bit you know, more about you know, the industrial base um, and its strength. You know, there's been a lot of discussion here in the US about the fragility of the industrial base um, and uh, you know, our ability to surge production. Um, how are, what are some ways that we can try to you know, facilitate the ability to both surge production on the you know, kind of back end if there is a, a war or crisis, uh, but also just to make the industrial base you know, stronger day to day? Because you already, we already have plenty of cases where you know, suppliers are sole sourced or suppliers are at the, you know, doing the, the, the bare minimum to be able to, to stay in business. How do we do that other than, other than just you know, buying a lot more stuff? Cool. Someone literally wrote the book on anti-fragility, and that's what it's called. Right. It's a gentleman named Nassim Taleb. Mm -hmm. So if you've read Black Swan in the past, uh, another of his books is called Anti-Fragility. And basically, the concept is almost all systems, whether they're natural or man-made systems, when subjected to a shock or disruption, weaken or even fail. And his theory is there are ways to reduce that risk of failure and maybe even uh, build and design a system that if it is disrupted, can actually get stronger. Right. We don't need to go that far, but let's how about <laughs> keep it resilient. And some of the principles that apply to our industry are, again, multi-year contracts, right? And that goes all the way back to the supply base. And this is very basic principle, which is, again, most of our subcontractors for you know, Boeing Defense and General Dynamics, they are in commercial businesses, usually the majority of their revenue. And so it's whether it's 80-20 or 60-40, defense work is not the driver of their company's success. Commercial work is. And so if the returns look better mm -hmm. and the length of time I know that I'm going to have business or expect to have business is longer, right. I as the supplier am going to invest more in defense article infrastructure, buildings, machinery, tooling, talent. But if I've got one-year contracts, and as we see what's happening in town this week, right. um, I don't know if that, that contract's going to be there at all next year, or is it a CR? Does my new program even start? They're like, well, you know, again, 80% of my revenue is coming from the commercial industry, which doesn't have these problems. Right. And so I'm going to focus my, yeah. my efforts there. And yeah, it's, it's a key supplier to us. Right. And then we can't complete the build of the, of, of, of the platform, the very complex platform, because the suppliers are, are shying away from this. So multi-year mm -hmm. procurement agreements are really important. Long lead time items, because some of the inputs to our supply chain, it takes two or three years to get yeah. through to it lands at Fort Worth for the F-35. So let's figure out those long poles in the tent and buy enough of them for 18 to 24 months 
so that if there's another pandemic or there's a, a disruption in supply chain or a blockade of, of some sort of material, that we've got enough to keep the line going and not have a gap in the line. Th these are pretty basic things. Yep. Now, the, the issue with anti-fragility is it's not free. Right. So there's going to have to be some level of investment that right. with one customer, it's the DOD has to make, right. or our allies through FMS that says, I will pay 5% more per aircraft for anti-fragility, or t whatever the number is. And that's the long lead time. It's the multi-year procurement and all those kinds of things. Uh, Multi-sources, for example. Right, I was bring it up. And solid rocket motors is everybody's, uh, you know, everybody's favorite example now. That you know, if we've only got one supplier for the critical component, and they have a strike, which has mm -hmm. just recently happened with one of our suppliers, there's nowhere else to go. Again, line stops three months later. Um, when COVID happened, we were unable to ship segments of the aircraft for the F-35 out of the UK and into the United States because the ports weren't open in the UK and they weren't going to work there. So even though our factory was running, you can have all kinds of disruptions. So there's a cost to anti-fragility, but the, the, the methods are very well understood. And, you know, they're in Talib's book and, and common practice in, in most industries. And so some of it, which you kind of hinted at was the idea of, you know, not just, uh, you know, kind of laying in some investment to allow, you know, long lead items and multi-year procurement, but also uh, spreading production around to address the fragility of a particular geographic location or, you know, to, you know, help friendshoring to kind of help our allies and partners feel more, you know, kind of integrated with the, the defense uh, establishment in the U.S. Right. So, but there's an investment there too, because obviously it's most efficient probably to do everything in one place mm -hmm. and have that place specialize in it. That's right. There's a there's an approach to this, and the commercial airline industry took it for engines and aircraft decades ago, and I was involved in some of that, which was, let's have a deliberate strategy for global right. sustainment and production. Right. And that's even more relevant, I would say, to DOD than a commercial airline because the DOD is going to operate in contested logistics environment very far from the United States. And whether it's the Pacific or Eastern Europe or the Middle East, we, we are through the period of non-contested logistics, right? And therefore, it will be difficult and risky to send a spare part from, you know, Iwakuni, Japan, to Fort Worth to get fixed. And so we should have a deliberate, and we're starting this with our company and saying, instead of just doing offset, oh, we sold some F-35s to Romania or wherever it's gonna be, they want some industrial participation. What can we do to dissatisfy that request? No, we wanna have a deliberate approach, regional sustainment and production, that when we do get an opportunity to invest in another country or we get a technology releaseability yeah. for that country, yeah, we want, uh, you know, a Black Hawk sustainment operation in right. the South China Sea somewhere. So those are, those are deliberate strategies which we're building for at least our company. But I, I would argue DOD should have that too right. because of the contest, especially because of the contested logistics issue that's rising. So there, again, that gives you anti-fragility. Right. So if you combine all three of these efforts, one is the anti-fragility in the basic production system, some investment there, digital uh, acceleration of technology like AI and autonomy and 5G and all those things across platforms and to do missions. Right. And then you combine it with the internationalization right. of the production and procurement system. It's all self uh, you know, integrated and mutually supportive, right. three lines of effort that if you could do them all at some level would advance our deterrent capability. Right, it, well yeah, that makes sense. Uh, so uh, one more question before I turn to the audience. It, um, so this suggests that maybe we need to look at our force design. We need to think about the future force with these ideas in mind. I mean, that's something we've talked about a lot in our research is how do we evolve our force design to make it better able to take advantage of digital modernization, right? So make it so that more of the capability resides in the software and that the hardware is more commoditized, if you will. Um, how do we make it so that you can make, you know, production can be expanded to pl other places? Um, you know, how do we change some of the rules with regard to export controls to, to tackle that? Do we need to think about changing the force design or evolving our force design with these ideas in mind as opposed to just making the best gadget? I, I would say not necessarily. Uh, the big superstructure works today, which is, first of all, civilian control of the military, congressional oversight, um, services that are meant to you know, organize, train, and equip yeah. forces, 
combatant commands that employ those forces when and if needed and, for, and, create, and create the deterrence level out in the regions. I don't think any of that needs to change. Right. But there are some systemic changes that DOD should introduce. Again, the, the standards body for, mm -hmm. we call it 5G.mil in our company, but whatever they're going to call it, I hope they come up with one where we'll participate with others. Secondly, that faster procurement right. system, w which matches right. the cycle time of the digital world. Those are things that are systemic, but yeah. they are not completely turning everything upside right. down. Right. Basically, we've tried to do this at our company. It's, again, Pathfinder. We have four big business areas, we call them, or divisions. And, you know, look, the, Arm the DOD has Space Force, right. Army, right. Navy, the Air Force, et cetera. There's no need to change our divisions, and there's no need to change that right. organization. There's no need to flip some kind yeah. of combatant command right. structure to something else. But there are some structural, major structural changes right. that we're suggesting that might be right. constructive to this and make it even better. Right. And that's what we've tried to do inside our company, too. So we, we call it, or I do, the Z-axis. Yeah. So how do we take, and I'll just use our example, Lockheed Martin's four uh, big business areas and shoot those mission maps right. through the Z-axis and say, what can we do as right. an entire you know, enterprise, if you will, to make that mission more capable? I don't care if it's a helicopter that came out of our RMS division tied to uh, an F-35 that came out of our aeronautics division. You know, we, we want to create that data flow that makes the most sense. And we have a space division that's pretty robust too. So let's, let's just start doing this ourselves right. Right. and shoot the Z-axis through. And that's the national security strategy, right? To be able to connect multi-domains, mm -hmm. so you know, everything from space to undersea, multi-service, Army, Navy, Air Force, doesn't matter where the sensor is or who owns the platform and ultimately our allies, right? So if we could, if we could just keep the superstructures right. we have and create that process, the workflow of a Z-axis through that, we'll make it much more effective using digital technology. And it's evolving the capabilities then to make them better able to uh, adapt with right. digital technology. I mean, so, so you're, you're expecting the F-16 to evolve over time, to become yeah. more and more able to be adaptable and flexible. That's right, and you can you can pod an F-16. We're, we're building the pod right now that basically is, we call it a 5G dot mill edge compute node on, again, a, a you know decades old design aircraft. Now, the next generation plane, if we're right. chosen to build one, will have that as part and parcel. You don't need a pod anymore. But, but we can do these kinds of things uh, with existing platforms in almost all cases. Right. So I'll turn to the audience now. So uh, questions, um, I'll call on you and then make sure you provide your name and affiliation. Uh, can you bring the microphone up here, please? Um, I'll start right here in the front. Sir, good morning. George Nicholson, the Washington liaison for the, for the Global Special Operations Forces Foundation. I flew as a 141 aircraft commander, 4,000 hours. I flew 123s in Vietnam with 2,000 hours. I flew 130s. I also helped set up U.S. SOCOM. Background, I did the requirements for the V-22 for U.S. SOCOM. Mm -hmm. I did the requirements for personnel recovery for OSD. One of the things you hit the nail on the head is basically the issue we've got with the requirements process. And I know General Raymond has mentioned it, and General Salzman, and General uh, Swartz, Norty Swartz said, it's too late if we don't have industry know what we're putting in an RFP. If you wait to bring them into it, it's too late. We need to change the system so we can bring industry in and say, this is the effect, this is the thing. Give us your in inputs mm -hmm. and, uh, and to go ahead and, and do that. I look at one of the uh, uh, things that the Marine Corps are doing. They don't have a, a, a tribal mentality. They're taking their F-35s and saying, it's not a one-trick pony. I can put that behind the lines. I can use the sensors on it to find targets to identify targets, mm -hmm. link 16 on all my platforms, digitize that, pass that on, and then do the battle damage assessment. Why do I need special tactics people to go out there and do that? So again, uh, that, that, that piece, how do you really get back and integrate? And then the last thing is, how do you reinstitute what Kelly Johnson and Ben Rich did for what was it, 18 months for the SR-71, or what they did for you know, other platforms? I think if you go back to this mission roadmap and say, what do I have today? How can I increase the capability most effectively, most quickly? 
and do it with the customer. I mean, they should be in the room, right? So if it's the air to air mission, we should be with the Air Force leadership, Navy leadership, Marine leadership and say, okay, what do you really need to do to make your air to air mission more effective? And they're all gonna have, as you said, slightly different perspectives and requirements, but let's debate those and have some of these commercial companies in the room too to say, look, you know, we want to have uh, a drone that will be able to take the missile, right? You know, if, if, I, if I'm a pilot and I, I get a, a, a raw signal that says you're being tracked, right? How do I get that drone behind me so that it takes the missile instead of me? That'd be like one element of a, of a mission, a survivability that you, would, you could create. And what the pilots will tell you is, I don't want a dumb drone. I want a smart drone as if Brian was in the seat, but he's not. It's AI. The AI has to be as good as Brian so I can trust it, right? It can't get spoofed. It can't get overtaken with uh, being hacked and crash into me. So we want to have everybody in the room. This is, like you said, pre-requirements. What is the mission gap you have? I mean, we're trying to draw it out and right. with what we know and understand, but I th we've got to have pilots in the room. We've got to have line commanders in the room, right. you know, flag officers and say, what, who's got the technology right. that can, can solve that mission gap? So I, I, don't, I don't have a risk of losing an airplane. I'm losing a you know, $500,000 drone instead of a $100 million airplane. Right. Those are the kinds of things that government and, and DOD and the services are gonna have to evolve to get more comfortable with because creating requirements you know, in, in, a, in a room in the Pentagon basement, when you don't know how we can move data around with IBM Red Hat, right. is not gonna be the right solution and it's gonna be late. Yeah, and, uh, and you know, to, DOD is trying to do this. I mean, there's been some examples of programs like the Navy with the requirements evaluation team they did for the frigate with uh, some of the work on uh, rapid capabilities office that, that is done in the yep. Air Force and new programs. So um, there's examples of that. So next question. Um, oh, uh, up here in front, a uh, young lady there. <laughs> Hi, um, Audrey Decker with Defense One. Thanks for doing this. On the new schedule for TR3, uh, at AFA last month, some Air Force officials said that that new schedule is still high risk. And so I was wondering, you know, what do, have you guys built in enough leeway in that new schedule? And then once deliveries get started, you know, how tight is that timeline? What's the likelihood of some of those deliveries being pushed to 2025? So we, we in the Joint Program Office, which manages the F-35 program, we do feel that it's manageable risk to get to, you know, second quarter of next year deliveries with the TR3 program, uh, test flights completed. But, you know, it, it is sort of a cutting edge technology insertion on a very complex platform that has to do all the things I was talking about, you know, anti-spoofing, uh, formation flying, uh, counter jamming, you know, it's a serious EW environment out there now. And so we've got to keep flying the jet in all kinds of what we call corner cases to make sure that the aircraft and the systems are going to perform. This will be worth the wait because the qualifications of what we, when the commercial space we call a mobile edge compute node, meaning a vehicle that 5G can control autonomously, right? It's a delivery drone for Amazon or it's a, it's a Tesla driverless car someday. Those requirements are very similar to what we're doing in the F-35 right now on the technical dimensions, and they are complicated. So we want to make sure this works, and the, and the reason this is important is because the F-35 TR2 version has the best attributes of the three areas you need to have an effective edge compute node. That's data storage, size that you need, data processing capability, and basically a server, you know, how, how robust is your server, and multi-path connection to the cloud, right? Cloud is defined by what system you're part of. The F-35 TR2 has the, the highest technical capabilities and parameters on all three of those dimensions, and TR3 is gonna take it up like literally another order of magnitude on all three of them. So this is worth the wait. We're gonna do it right. 
and the jet has to perform in a really harsh environment, especially with EW and, and other risks and issues that are out there. So we will expect to get it done by the second quarter of next year. But again, it will be worth the wait because the capability on board that aircraft will be, un, from a digital perspective, will be unlike any other in any Air Force in the world. One follow-up really quick. So when yeah. you just talk about 5G, um, you're, when you, it's not the same. You're talking about a, a, a version of 5G that's being employed by these right. platforms. This, so it's yeah, this is not this, standard, is, this is not, not the commercial standard right. 5G right. using the commercial wavelengths right. uh, and, and frequencies. We, we call this 5G.mil, the architecture, on purpose because we have to be able to do all those things in a contested, hostile environment with you know, little or zero risk of disruption. And there's another issue that comes with this that, that commercial companies literally don't understand, but as an ex-pilot, I, I do and you do, which is something called low probability of intercept, right? LPI means if you're a fighter pilot and you're transmitting the radio to Brian or you're sending a data packet to another airplane, you are now findable, right? You're transmitting R at radio frequency energy. You can be targeted. So we want to have the ability to send data. This is the 5G part. 5G is how many bits per second can you send on, a, on one hertz of spectrum. And there's a... There, there's a, there's a uh, a range for that, which 5G is way better than 4G. Um, how fast does the signal, it's called latency, go to the receiver and get a response? The latency of 5G is 10 times better than 4G. That's important because if you're controlling autonomous vehicles, you need really rapid signal processing and transmission. And so these are the kinds of things that will enter into our ability to build deterrence, right? Because I can move more data faster with less probability of intercept or jamming than I could yesterday. And that makes my squadron way more effective. So uh, next question, let's see. Um, oh, John. <laughs> yeah. um, well, thank you for doing this. This has been very helpful and I think it helps our audience in Washington largely to understand what they need to understand for this to work. You have not talked about what we hear problems with in a variety of other sectors in our country, that is workforce, about the quality, about resiliency, and, uh, and, and how, you, how you manage uh, the current environment. Could you say a little bit about that in both your company and in the, in, in the defense space? Yeah, certainly, and, and the challenge was illuminated with, with the COVID pandemic, right? Uh, we have the benefit of kind of a very mission-focused workforce. A lot of people, it's 120,000 people. But they've joined, and, and this could be said, said the same for General Dynamics or Boeing Defense or whatever. People join our companies because they have some concept of the mission, and it's important. So when the COVID pandemic occurred and we got the national security waiver for our, our production operations, for example, People's neighbors were hanging out at home and getting paid, and they were going to work in the middle of COVID. And so that's the level of dedication, the mission commitment people have. So we have that uh, on our side. The second thing is 20% of our employees are veterans, right? So this is like 30,000 people who've, you know, been in the soup and, you know, no, known friends that, you know, uh, needed the best equipment, I'll say, and best equipment. People think it's important. And they're around. I mean, they're in, the, they're in the workforce. They're in the SCIF. That's who you're working with. And you kind of don't forget what the mission is that, from that perspective. And look, the other thing we've done is try to be mindful of society, right? So society basically moved to, well, you can work from home now. Well, that doesn't really <laughs> synchronize with everything we need to do. But we move towards it. So I'll give you a really quick, you know, just basically a framework that we use. So, Unless you're in a factory that has a certain production schedule or a SCIF or the customer site, uh, you can, at our company, everybody's got a four day week, four, four days a week, 10 hours a day that isn't in those circumstances that they're prohibited. And very few people, almost none, percentage wise, get work from home 100%. Okay? So we kind of landed on this four day week. And within that four day week, the, the local manager can decide hey, you can. 
you know, Brian, you can stay, you can work from home one of those four days, and then they'll create a schedule around that, or two of those four days, or oh, wait, your your kid's graduating from high school, you can work from home all week. So, we've got the flexibility now built in. Everybody gets a three-day weekend that's qualified to work that schedule, and they can have flexibility within that four-day week. And we, our retention is twice as good as the rest of industry because of some of those things. Uh, Next question. Sir, in the back there. <laughs> uh, good morning. I'm Dimitri, the US-China correspondent with the Financial Times. Um, two quick questions. How is the next looming shutdown uh, affecting your ability or your thoughts about uh, surging, ramping up production for Ukraine? And secondly, you, know, you talk about the fragility of the industrial base. It was clear that Ukraine, that the industrial base here wasn't ready. If U.S. intelligence determined that China was going to move on Taiwan in a month's time, would the U.S. and the industrial base be ready? And if not, how big is the gap, do you think? So, so we're getting ready to be ready. Uh, I got asked about three months into the Ukraine war how long it would take us to double our production of one of the products that we, create, uh, that we build. And I had to say three years because that was what it would take. A lot of that has to do with the supply chain ramping up, right? So my approach to this is we should establish what peacetime production rates efficiently are, but have the ability to ramp up, as you're suggesting, that production rate sort of two standard deviations above the mean, right? So there's not infinite flexibility, but significant flexibility, and we need to decide as a country and a government how much is that worth? Because again, there is, there is a cost to anti-fragility. Um, and that's the long lead time items, it's the multi-year procurements, uh, it's commitments by Congress to not have interruptions in, in, in those uh, orders, if you will. Um, continuing resolutions and government shutdowns do not stop our operations. We are uh, authorized to continue to produce on contracts we already have. But a new start or an investment to increase cap capacity would not be uh, av available to us until the CR or the government shutdown is concluded. But from our core business, we can continue to operate. But making improvements, changes, switching from one contract that doesn't need as much volume that year to another one can't be done. There are some real disruptions there. Uh, they are not catastrophic, but there's some real disruptions there. Uh, all right, we got time for maybe one more question. Sir, right there. Uh, good morning, Mark Vlasic from uh, Techstar is the largest pre-seed investor in the world, but used to work as a special assistant to Robert Gates. I'd love to hear a bit more about how you're working with the tech startup community, uh, particularly kind of your vision of Lockheed as a platform for bringing all these clean players together. Sure, so um, our company had a venture capital group inside Lockheed Martin and had about a $200 million uh, corpus, you know, investment fund, which is pretty small for a VC firm. But uh, I doubled it the first month I was there and said, look, let's, let's double down on this and, and let's find, and we do this very purposefully, what are the technology gaps that we think we may have? What are promising startups that may be able to fill those gaps? And we'll take a 15, 20% stake in, in that company if it proves out in our due diligence and help them be successful and have some you know, access to what they're doing so that we can incorporate it if it's gonna work into what, what we're doing. That's one element. <clears throat> and the second thing I did when I came uh, off the board and into management was to create a fully owned subsidiary inside of Lockheed Martin, not the venture group, which is already there, but we call it LM Evolve, Lockheed Martin Evolve so that we can team up with outside investors on bigger investments. And those investments could be in kind, for example. So one of the projects that we're pursuing is, is lunar services through this Lockheed Martin Evolve. Now, the important thing about fully owned subsidiary is it's not in one of those four big business units I talked about. It's not subject to the federal acquisition regulation. We can make investments and have whatever margins we can get in the world uh, from that. But what we want to do is bring our IP in and our capabilities with a commercial partner, big or small, to solve a problem that is, that is mutual to the DOD and, and commercial industry of some sort. So I'll give you uh, 
two examples. One is the lunar services, which is mobility. We partner with GM on the lunar rover of the future, which will be autonomous, meaning while there are a astronauts on the moon, they can drive the vehicle for their needs. When they're not there, in between missions, manned missions, the autonomous vehicle will do experiments and map the grounds and do all kinds of things. Uh, because what we also have to have then is a PNT, like a GPS for the moon, so that this car will navigate. We have to have a comm link, a broadband comm link back to Earth to tell it what to do and bring data back. So these lunar service packages is something we're going to build outside the disclosure statement and not be subject to all the regulations we generally have. The, another one is that we've uh, created, invented, a, a, it's called a flow battery uh, device. It's a big, big device, actually, which is, ver is very efficient for energy storage. And it was originally designed to be kind of a mobile energy storage uh, unit for a deployed squadron of the Air Force or, or a company of soldiers. But there's a huge interest now in battery storage in the commercial world, and that will go into Evolve as well. We have a partner kind of lined up, which I don't, I don't have finished yet, so I can't say who, who it might be. But take it out to a, a commercial industry, which is 10 times bigger than the DOD demand will ever be. And that's how we'll monetize that IP and, and do it with someone where we won't get into commercial energy storage. We don't have the marketing team. We don't have the experience in that. But our partner will. They just don't have the IP on how to actually do this energy chemistry. And so those, that's what we're doing with Evolve. So those are the two big initiatives we're doing. And really the third one is with the Verizons, and literally we've announced partnerships with Verizon, Microsoft, IBM, as I mentioned, uh, Intel, there's, uh, there's a number of others that the really big leading technology companies want to work with us on the common architecture. And we're doing things with uh, Verizon on 5G, Red Hat on AI, as I said earlier. We have a partnership with NVIDIA on simulation. So these are companies you'd go, they're working with Lockheed Martin? Yeah, well, they are. Microsoft is doing our classified cloud with us. So there's a lot of things that we have going on. Do these companies see that there's going to be um, IP that they can pull from that? So it's not just them selling to the government. Do they think there's benefit to yeah, them? Yeah, absolutely, of Brian. So one of the CEOs of, of one of those companies said to me one day, and he was totally serious. He goes, you know, your problems are a lot easier than ours. And I'm like, wait a second. You, know, you don't know about the LPI, the cyber, you know, multi-classification, SAP, all this stuff. He goes, yeah, that's, that's all in there. But I'm going to have to try to control 200 you know, million vehicles on a 5G autonomous network someday. That's a harder problem than keeping four airplanes together <laughs> in the sky, you know, and, and stuff you're trying to do. So they want to work with us. Right. But it's got to have some benefit for them at the end of the day, either technology co-development, which they can apply, like I was just talking about, or um, you know, an actual revenue stream out of the Department of Defense someday. <laughs> so, right. and, and there's not a great mechanism for subscriptions yet. So they, right. they are playing ball with us. I, I hope they are patient because we have to change some of the system together with government to really get them excited about being part of this. Well, that's a lot of what we're trying to do here. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Jim, for being here today. Um, let's give uh, Jim a hand for being here. Thank, thank you very much. Um, appreciate it. Um, and uh, thank you all uh, for participating today. And uh, for the Hudson Institute, I'm uh, Brian Clark. And uh, thank you very much. Have a great day. Cheers.